All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, it looks like you all found the sign-in sheet, so that's great. If you uh, haven't had an opportunity to sign in, please do, if it's for a class or uh, just so that we know um, who came today. So thank you for coming. Today is actually our last um, Women's History Month day, since next week we're on spring break. And so this event is actually co-sponsored by the Anthropology Department and by Women's History Month. And so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anastasia Panagakos. I'm a professor here of anthropology. So welcome to our event. We're really happy to have you. Um, a couple of just housekeeping items uh, before we get started. Um, keep in mind that today's presentation is being video recorded and there will be some photos taken for the campus newspaper and those kinds of things. Um, if you could silence your cell phones during the presentation, that would be wonderful. And again, if you need to sign in, uh, the sign-in sheets are over there on the table. I would like to introduce Dr. Goldfield uh, at this time. Um, Dr. Goldfield is an archaeologist and she received her PhD from Boston University. Her specialty is in analyzing faunal remains from archaeological sites with particular emphasis on the diets of Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. Currently she's working on a project that uses Arctic and subarctic food preservation strategies as a way of understanding Neanderthal and anatomically modern human behavior in cold weather climates of Eastern and Northern Europe. She is also the illustrator of the comic book, The Neanderthal Child of, how am I going to pronounce that? Roque de Marsal. Just like it says. Yep. Roque de Marsal, a prehistoric mystery. And uh, there is a copy of the comic book I noticed over here. So um, we can take a look at that. And she's going to do all sorts of wonderful, cool things today. So um, Anna, thank you very much for agreeing to do this presentation. And uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy that you all could be here, especially uh, right before spring break. I truly appreciate it. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, so this is going to be a talk about how I've used illustration, and um, it's, it's something I love and something I'm good at, in a totally different career, in, in the career of archaeology. So I am an archaeologist and an anthropologist, and specifically I study uh, animal bones and what we can learn about human behavior from animal bones. And I study Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis. So these are our closest ancient relative. We are Homo sapiens, they were Homo neanderthalensis, we share a genus. Um, these individuals lived in Europe for more than 200,000 years before modern humans started traveling into Europe out of Africa around 50,000 years ago. And there are no modern populations of Neanderthals left today in the world. Some of us, most of us here in this room, have some Neanderthal DNA, but there are no full-blooded Neanderthals alive today. So why did they go extinct? There are many, many, many different theories. Uh, many of them have to do with the idea that Neanderthals and modern humans behaved in different ways. Um, the differences in behavior may not have been a disadvantage for Neanderthals when they were the only species uh, of human, of our, you know, in, within our human lineage um, living in Europe, but when modern humans came into the area and they all of a sudden were competing for similar resources, things might have been different. So for my research, I wanted to know if there were differences in the ways that Neanderthals and modern humans butchered their prey. So um, would the way that they used the animals that they hunted have given them an advantage one way or the other? So when they butchered an animal, did they only eat the meat? Did they break apart the bones to get at the marrow inside, which is full of fat and really, really nutritious, very high calorie? Did they go even further and boil the bones to try and get even more of that fat? Because when you boil bones, I don't know if you guys have ever cooked a piece of meat in liquid for a really long time, but basically you start cooking the fat and gelatin out of that meat and it's super nutritious. Um, so looking at the animals that the Neanderthals hunted, can give us lots and lots of information about the other aspects of their lives. And that's something that I really find fascinating. So the data I was collecting for my research 
were really interesting to me, but it's not exactly sexy archaeology talking about sitting in a garage and entering bone measurements into a computer. So that's not actually what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk to you about something related, um, a secondary project that came out of my work as an archaeologist. And that is art and illustration. So in addition to my academic work, I've always had an interest in art. It's always been something I've had a talent for. And it's, I've used it in the field and elsewhere in my life for years. So these are some illustrations that I did in the field. Uh, part of it's from my work in South Africa. Part of it is from some work I did in the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska. And usually I do these as references for the team that I'm excavating with or for publications that will later come out on that material. Um, often I do it for my own, uh, for, for practice and for my own enjoyment. Um, so how do these two things come together? How, how does this relate to the comic book that I produced? How do art and archaeology come together to make something like a comic book? So. Here's the story about that. In 2011, I began work at a site in the Dordogne region of southwest France called La Ferrasi. And there's me in the trench doing actual archaeology. Um, it's an extremely well-known Neanderthal site, famous for several Neanderthal skeletons that were found there in the early years of the 20th century. And while I was there, since I was interested in archaeological illustration, I would do practice sketches of some of the artifacts in my spare time. And the chiefs who were running the excavation saw what I was doing, saw that I was uh, good at illustration, and they approached me with a project that they'd been kicking around uh, among themselves for a while. All of them were professors at different universities, and they wanted to create an introduction to archaeology textbook that was instead of being a dry academic textbook, they wanted something that was really approachable for beginners, and they wanted to do it in the form of a comic book or a graphic novel. So the book, which ended up being this, uh, the book on the table there, The Neanderthal Child of Rakhta Marsal, was going to tell the story of an excavation at a different site in the same region, Rakhta Marsal. And uh, that site is famous for the skeleton of a Neanderthal child. It was a, a around three-year-old um, Neanderthal child that was found at the site in the 1960s. Now, the French team that originally excavated it called it a Neanderthal burial, and this was a big deal because they were implying that Neanderthals buried their dead in the same way that humans do. The team that I worked with later, uh, who re-excavated the site starting in 2004, weren't so sure about this. And they carried out another excavation to test that story. And the purpose of the textbook that we were going to write would be to take the reader through uh, looking at the question of, is this a real burial? What do we call a real burial? And setting up um, evidence for whether or not we could call this Neanderthal child skeleton a true burial. So the goals of the book were to guide the reader first through the excavation of Roque de Marsal, to set up the investigation of this burial theory that the French team had come up with, and to, along the way, introduce the basics of archaeological methods. So as you're reading the book, you get an introduction into what it's like to perform an excavation. So the first task was to set up the narration of the book. And to do that, we decided to create a character, a fictional anthropologist, to walk us through the story, to interact with the other characters in the book, the excavators, the team, the researchers, asking questions along the way. So here's our, our imaginary cartoon anthropologist. And here is a picture of what the Dordogne region looks like. It's this beautiful green region. It's got all of these massive limestone cliffs with rivers running through it. It's a lot of farmland, a lot of forest land. It's very rural. Uh, the wine's pretty great. And um, the thing about having all of these limestone cliffs is that the water trickles through the cliffs and over thousands and thousands of years creates tunnel systems and caves. And humans and our early ancestors, like the Neanderthals, used those caves as shelters. So there are hundreds of Neanderthal and later early modern human sites uh, in this region. So it's an incredibly 
um, well-studied region with a real depth of understanding, and it's given us lots and lots of information about Neanderthals and the humans that came after them. So we need to step back a little bit, uh, and this is what we did in the book, and get some context for how we know what we know about Neanderthals. How do we know how they lived? How do we know what they did with their time? Well, first of all, um, we can, the two pieces of evidence that we find the most often in Neanderthal sites are stones and bones, and these are some stone tools that uh, were found uh, in a Neanderthal site, in fact, at Rock de Marsal. So stone tools are deliberately modified pieces of stone, and it's often a material like chert or obsidian um, or flint. And these materials are especially good because when you um, impact them against another stone, they break in reliable, repeatable ways. So a skilled tool maker can hit a piece of flint or obsidian and make it break exactly the way he wants to make it break and create the type of tool that he needs. So these are examples of tools that we call scrapers. Whether or not they were actually used for scraping um, is a matter of some debate, but we can infer from their shape that one of the things that they could have been used for was scraping materials. Um, so the other thing that we find in abundance in Neanderthal sites is animal bones. So these tell us what kinds of animals the Neanderthals were hunting, but also the kinds of environments that they were living in. For example, if we see lots of bones from animals like red deer and wild pigs, we know that the climate was warmer and wetter, and we know that the area around the site would have been more forested because that's the kind of environment that these animals tend to live in, they tend to prefer. On the other hand, if we see bones from animals like bison or mammoth or wild horse, those tell us that this was a colder, drier plains environment. So the things that are in a, a Neanderthal site, apart from the Neanderthal bones, actually can tell us a great deal about daily activities and about uh, Neanderthal ways of life. So there's, there's our background, there's our setting. We have information from stone tools, we have the information from animal bones. Now let's look at the information surrounding that Neanderthal child skeleton. So this is the site of Roque de Marsal. So you can see it's a large limestone cave. And this is from the beginnings of the excavations in the early 2000s. So um, it's a big limestone tunnel system. And then at some point there was a collapse leaving um, a cave mouth open. And uh, Neanderthals and uh, later people used this cave as shelter. And caves are great. They put a roof over your head. You can keep them warm with a fire. You can um, keep yourself safe from predators as long as there aren't bears already living in the cave. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really reliable place to live. Um, and so it's no wonder that they were often chosen as habitation sites. So you can see the excavation has already started. You can see the trench going into the cave. And that star on the map is where we were standing in that previous photo. So you can see it's really quite a big cave system with extensive excavations in the cave on the left-hand side. And this is just to show uh, some of the, uh, the, the cave system and exactly what was excavated. So these light gray and darker gray squares are the material that was excavated in the first, uh, the first effort in, in the 60s and then later um, by our team in 2004. Okay, so here is the Neanderthal child of Rock de Marsal. It was a skeleton discovered in 1961, excavated fully by 1963, and uh, reconstructed beautifully in the Prehistory Museum in the town uh, near Rock de Marsal uh, by Elizabeth Danier. And, um, you can see from the picture, despite the skull being uh, fractured and then put together, the skeleton is in really good shape considering that it's dated to 70,000 years old. So the preservation is pretty incredible and most of the skeleton was there, which is one of the main reasons why the French team decided that this was a deliberate burial. Because when things die, usually thousands and thousands of years ago, if they're not buried, carnivores come and scavengers come and they take pieces of that body away. 
So the fact that the skeleton was in such a relatively complete state was a real clue for them. And they said, oh, this must be a burial. This must have been a baby who, who died and was placed lovingly in a deliberately dug grave and, uh, you know, with grave goods. And uh, it was exactly as a human would be buried. Um, So what really does burial mean? For Neanderthals, are we expecting something like a human burial? And if we don't see elements of a human burial, can we rule out the idea of deliberate burial of a dead loved one altogether? So whether or not Neanderthals did bury their dead is a really important question in terms of understanding how they thought and how their worldview may or may not have been similar to the way we see things, the way that most human groups um, see the world and, and may con conceive of an afterlife. So right now we're going to sort of reapply the science of the excavation to this question of burial and see if it holds up. So this is a natural pit. It's the remains of what used to be a small tunnel in the wall of the cave. So over thousands of years, hollowed out by water into a small tunnel. And this is where the skeleton was found. The red X indicates where the skeleton was, and then the green line overhead indicates sort of the level of burial where the skeleton was buried. So what I want you to pay attention to here is that you can see multiple lines in the sediment um, covering, that would have been covering the skeleton. So there are multiple layers, distinct layers of sediment over the Neanderthal child. So think about digging a hole. When you dig a hole, everything that you dig out gets all mixed together. And then when you, if you fill the dirt back into the hole, it's all one homogenous pile of dirt that gets dumped back in. It's not gradual layers. So when we see something like this, what we're seeing is a hole that was filled in gradually over time, not something that was dug out and then filled back in. So the piece of information about the infant being in a deliberately dug grave doesn't really hold up here. For one thing, it wasn't a dug hole. It was a natural pit in the, in the limestone. And for another thing, there's no evidence that the pit was filled in altogether. It was filled in gradually over time. Now here's the other piece of evidence. Unfortunately, um, we only have one photo of the skeleton in situ, the way it was found in 1963 once it had been completely excavated. But you can see that um, despite the skull being broken into a number of pieces, um, the baby is in pretty good shape apart from being extremely dead. So um, the way that, it's difficult to see from this photo, but the way that the skeleton is oriented is actually head first down into that small tunnel. So the way that the skeleton was laid out the head was downhill, the arms were stretched out in front of it, and the legs were back towards the cave. Now that's a really unusual pose for something that we would call a deliberate burial. Usually, we think of burials as an individual's in the fetal position, or the individual's on their back with their arms crossed, something like that. Instead, the Neanderthal skeleton would have looked something like this, in the tunnel, head first, with its legs out behind it. And the reason uh, the, the skeleton doesn't have feet here is that was actually the case. The feet were, were missing when the child was excavated. So the evidence stacks up as the Rock de Marsal infant was in a natural pit, not in a purposely dug hole. It was in an atypical burial position. And it was covered by multiple sediment layers. So with that in mind, what can we conclude about the Rock de Marsal burial? And I put that in quotes. So we can say that it's not a conventional burial that we would associate with modern humans. Um, the infant may have been placed in a natural pit after it died. That's certainly a possibility. The infant may have had an accidental fall, and that may have caused its death. And that it may have just been there and that's where it died. Um, or after death, 
the infant's body may have ended up in the pit by accident. So Neanderthals may have been doing things a little bit differently. They were extremely similar to humans in other ways, and the fact that they are extinct now certainly doesn't mean that they were in any way stupid or inferior to modern humans. We know that they were extremely effective hunters and gatherers. They had a social system. They survived in Europe for hundreds of thousands of years successfully, but we may never truly know how they thought or how they perceived their world. So what we can say is we can rule out that the Roc de Marsal child was a burial in the sense of a modern human deliberate burial with some conception of the afterlife, but we can't completely rule out um, a Neanderthal um, in response to the death of a loved one doing something different rather than just leaving the body and moving on. So it gives us, it, it raises more questions than it answers, and it really gives us some things to think about. And if you, there's a more complete story if you'd like to um, page through the comic book later. Um, but before we wrap up, what I'd like to show you is how I actually did the illustrations for the book. So I used these two things. This is a Wacom digital illustration tablet. It comes with a handy dandy little pen. Um, it's not an actual pen, it's a stylus. And um, in the same way that you can write on an iPad or a, 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 you know, an e-reader with a stylus, um, this basically um, lets me draw on software um, using my computer. So let me just switch out of that view so that I can show you what I'm doing. Okay. Great, okay. So this is the program that I use to illustrate. It's called Sketchbook Pro. Um, it's a really great program. It's extremely, once you figure out how to um, draw on this but look on your computer screen, which it takes a little bit of adjusting, just in terms of being confused by everything. Um, once you figure out how to do that, you can very easily pick a brush, so there's you know pencil, airbrush, marker, pen, all of these things. And the great thing is that it lets you draw in layers. So for example, I'm gonna create a couple of new layers. And let's see, what's something vaguely anthropological that I could draw right now? Uh, any suggestions? A humorous. Everyone who's taken my osteology class right now is very upset. Okay, let's draw, let's do my best humorous. Okay, so I'm not gonna put you on the spot and ask you to name the parts of the humorous that I'm drawing right now. But let's pretend which one's medial, which one's lateral. Right, trochlea, capitulum. I may or may not be getting this backwards. Okay. So let's call that a humerus. It's pretty close, right guys? That's not so bad. Okay, so let's say that I wanted to make that humerus all kinds of different colors. I would go in and choose all my colors. Let's do bright pink humerus. And so now, um, instead of being on the layer where I drew the humerus, I'm on the layer below it. So I can go like this and not interfere with the lines that I just drew. So I can paint part of the humerus. I can change colors part way through. So this, basically this program lets me create lots and lots of images that we then combined with photographs of the region of the site um, to create these really, oops, um, kind of dynamic fun images uh, that was a way to um, illustrate what we were trying to um, the story we were trying to tell and, and these guides to archeological um, method and the way that you can use the evidence that you find in an archeological site to answer these questions, to put a theory to the test and to come up with maybe a totally new point of view that then uh, brings up more questions that you can then test with more archeology. span So it's a wonderful uh, ongoing never ending circle of of discovery and reinvention. And um, 
that's the thing that I like best about archaeology is the constant questioning and, and answering questions and sort of the thrill of the hunt for evidence. And I love that I was able to take a skill that I had and make that information and that excitement for archaeology accessible to a wide range, uh, a wide ranging audience. Um, I think that storytelling and art and illustration are really important for science outreach of all kinds. And um, if you have a talent like that, you, it doesn't have to be illustration. If you have a talent for photography or if you have a passion for songwriting or anything outside of your academic discipline, think about ways that you might be able to apply it to the things that you want and learn and the things that you want to tell people about because often um, opportunities for doing that might come up in a way that surprises you. And um, that was the case here. I was, I was really surprised and excited when um, the excavation chiefs approached me with this idea and it was, it was really fun to work with them and um, I, I really um, am happy that I did it and um, I'm happy that I was able to tell you guys about it. Um, so that about wraps it up for me. I'm happy to take questions. Um, but thank you very much for being here and listening. Yeah. Do you sell your comic book? <laughs> it's, so it's weird. It's available online. I know it's on Amazon. Um, it's, we published it through the Pearson publishing company specifically for one of those professor's classes. Like he uses it as an intro textbook and I'm not sure that Pearson makes it more widely available, but um, you can check online. As far as I know, it's still available on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Can you go back to the slide? Um, Hang on. One sec. Okay, uh, going back to that one. Bullet points. This one. Uh huh. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's completely possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, don't, we know that there was movement of water through um, Rock de Marsal um, over time, and the way that the sediments are deposited suggests that it, while it may have happened quickly, it didn't happen all at once. So maybe it was a, a season or two of rapid water movement and rapid movement of sediment from the cave that covered that pit. Yeah, that's totally possible. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not, it's not the minerals in the sediment layers that show that um, it wasn't filled back in. It's the sediment layers themselves. It's the fact that there are multiple different kinds of sediments, one on top of the other. So, Tiki, are you done writing? Okay, so I'm going to go back to this slide. So you can see... Um, there's, it, maybe it's harder to see on the actual projection, but there's a mix of like dark gray layers and sandy yellow layers and reddish layers. And those are all sediments that come from different sources. So we know that something over time was moving those different, just all together, all those different sediments was moving and a layer of one type settled and then a layer of another type settled, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so it's not just minerals moving around, it's the actual sediment itself. Yeah, is that a question? Uh, um, so, before I ask a question, so the comic book is used in uh, classrooms? Yeah, it's used as like a Anthro 101, Archaeology 101 okay. text. Well, I have two small questions. Okay. Uh, well, the first one is, um, would you ever consider doing another one or a sequel? Yeah, I, I, a sequel, yeah. No, I really want to. The archaeology too. This time, it's personal. I don't know. I know. Yeah, dig harder. Ugh. And then my second question was, uh, would you recommend uh, like other courses, not specifically you know, anthropology, but other courses do a similar approach? 
I mean, I absolutely would. I, I tend to think in pictures, and I think for people who are visual learners, and also just sort of the more informal approach that a comic book can have, like you can inject a little bit of humor into it. Um, one of my favorite books of all time, it's actually a series of books, is called The, um, the Cartoon History of the World, parts one, two, and three. And it's, it's a amazingly researched, really accurate, beautifully done, this, these thick comic books, it's these three thick comic books that it's the whole history of like Europe and Asia and Africa all together. It's amazing, it's wonderful. It's by Larry Gonick. Um, and I, if you're at all interested in history and, or just wanna read it because it's really fun, I can't recommend that enough. But yeah, even like there's, I've seen a, a comic book that tries to teach physics. Like if we, yeah, if we'd had that when I, when I took physics, maybe I would have done better at physics, who knows. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think, I think any, um, anything that makes a, a field of learning more approachable is a good thing. Archaeological or, or um, I, it's going to be somewhere in the U.S. So basically, I'm interested in overall in whoa hi overall in what Neanderthals ate, um, and I'm interested in specifically um, there's evidence from Native American groups and from like Viking groups and groups up in the north, uh, Inuit groups and other groups that they're eating fermented meat and they're like caching meat. And I wanna know um, if that's a possibility for Neanderthals to have been eating that because there are big changes in nutrition when meat ferments the way that it would if you put it in a pile and leave it alone for a while. Um, and it actually uh, can become really nutritious. And I'm wondering if there is evidence for Neanderthals doing that. So I'm gonna be doing something to do some experiments to test that. So. I'm setting myself up for some really, really gross days of just taking samples of rotten meat, but it's worth it for science. Yay. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you guys so, oh, just kidding, hello. No, they were, they were gone. I think they were, it was the legs, I believe, ended before the distal ends of the, of the tibia and fibula. So the, the bones were actually broken. So it may be that they were sticking out and a carnivore or scavenger did run away with them. Uh, something else totally may have happened. Uh, we don't know, but they weren't there. Yeah. What made you want to do that? It's much more, so I originally thought that uh, I would do classical languages because that's what I got really interested in in high school for whatever reason. And then I, I realized that I was much more interested in how people behave rather than just um, language and, and reading. Um, I wanted to answer questions about people interacting. And so a way to do that and stay in the same old, old time period was to do archeology. span So yeah, I really like it. Yeah. Good. All right, thank you guys so much. Thank you.